Greetings and salutations, friend. I am Jeremy Tank, and if you are watching this, I am your brand guy. What does that mean? Well, it means you've got someone to talk about the ideas about brand, branding, your website, all that kind of stuff, but it goes so much deeper than that because my specialty in particular is the psychology behind, within, around, surrounding, the idea of brand. And really, it's the power of belief in brand, the power of faith in brand, the power of creating your vision and pursuing it, making the best of who you are for the world, making yourself the best version of you for the world, because you're worth that, right? Like, if there's anything, anything possible about this world that's worth investing in, that is worth planning, thinking about, it's your life, right? The experience that you have on a daily basis, the things you want to do, the places you want to go, this is who you are. It's, it's part of you. It's your drive. It's your focus, you know? I'm sure you know, because you live your life. And of all the things that happen, you're the one that determines, is it good? Is it bad? Can it be better? Am I helping it be better? See, I'm a little bit concerned about the way you're looking at the world. I'm concerned about the way everyone's looking at the world. Because most people seem to want to complain about the way things are instead of investing in the way things could be. And the part of the investment here isn't money, it's energy. It's ideas. It's thoughts. It's feelings. It's community, right? This is the kind of investment we need. People who are willing to imagine something for themselves, honestly. You can imagine something for yourself. Be a little selfish about what you want to build in your future. About the people that you want to help. You don't have to help everybody if you could just help yourself and a couple others. There's something about being an adult today that a lot of the people I meet and talk to are afraid to step into their own power. They're afraid to step into their own life. They really want someone else to care for them. They really want someone else to baby them. And this is a pretty big trained response. Sonia, do not attack the plants. Cats. Um, this is a trained response. This, this I need someone else because thing. And it has roots in not being able to trust yourself, in not being able to be yourself, in not feeling enough, not feeling like the world is there, that you can go for it. This is all training from way in your past. And it's hard to see all of the different places that it creeps up and creeps into you. Until at some point, you come home from work and you immediately are reaching for a beer or a cigarette or, or something to, to mollify the pain, something to numb it, something to help you express anger and frustration and vitriol about just your day. It's your day. It's a standard day. Today's Friday. And if this is already part of your routine, you're like, I can't wait to get out to, to have a couple of drinks, to relax and actually like calm down, then something needs to change in your life. Something about the way you see your life needs to change because you are already fighting against the greatness that you hold it in, in anything. And when you're fighting against it, it, it just, it builds anger. It builds resentment, right? It builds these emotions that you feel you can't let go of because perhaps if you let go of them, it pushes the people away. People are a lot more resilient than that. You know, and a lot of this, uh, I need somebody to help me. I need somebody to push me. I need somebody to supervise me. I need somebody to uh, cajole me. I need someone to track me. I need someone to, like, we, we place these, these ideas, I need someone to, out into the world a lot. Because we feel like, honestly, we can accomplish anything as long as someone's holding us accountable. Does that sound like Anything familiar to you? Maybe school? Work for some of us? Um, chores at home when you're really young? 
See, we're trained in this sort of behavior to trust someone else to give us the guidance. And the fact is, by the time you reach a certain age, there's nobody else to give you the guidance. It's your life, and you need to take control of it. The other day I said that, you know, it's a tragedy that we don't have this, this graduation ceremony in our culture in general from childhood to adult. Whatever place that happens, you know, 12, 13, 15, um, we sort of do it around 16 with driver's license, but honestly, we don't have a ceremony. We don't celebrate that a person has made it to adulthood. We just celebrate that all of a sudden they can push a 2,000 pound electric mm, out into traffic and hope they don't get hurt. It's not a celebration of adulthood. That is, it's a celebration of, of don't get injured. Um, so I found this quote. This quote uh, was uh, put on my friend Daniel's Facebook page and I actually printed it out because I really like this quote. And... It sort, of, it sort of gets at the root of what I've been talking about this week with the active experience, with understanding that all of these emotions, all of these feelings, all of these thoughts, ideas, training, concepts pop up for you. And they're meant to help you. They're meant to pull you out of, of whatever you're facing, whatever experience that is in life, and help you reflect on the choices that would be the safest for you. Now, is the safest the most fun? Hell no. <laughs> Hell no. Is the safest the thing that is going to get you to your goals or to, you know, whatever you actually want to be doing in life? Hell no. The safest is really just the way to, to close down more and more and more and more until you reject society's change, until you reject new information, until you reject science, until you reject everything, except for that piece that's in your tiny bubble. So here's the quote uh, by Vienna Ferron. Vienna Ferron. Okay. You don't want to change because you want to be loved just as you are. I get it. But here's the thing. We all need to start accepting that there are two kinds of change. There's unhealthy, dysfunctional change that asks us to mold into someone we're not in order to please another. It's the kind of change that asks us to abandon ourselves. Our worth is questioned, and so we hold on to sayings like, if you can't handle me at my worst, then you don't deserve me at my best. And then there's healthy, functional, integrated change. This change is about growth and transformation. It doesn't take you farther away from yourself. It brings you closer. Make sure you're not resisting the latter. And I really liked that quote. I really like it because it's asking you to recognize these feelings of, of insufficiency. And they pop up in the most insidious ways, don't they? Um, this, l l late last night, I had somebody messaging me saying, um, you know, I, I've watched some of your videos and, uh, I, I, <laughs> I'm, I'm not you basically. I'm not you. I can't possibly like learn from you or get to where you are because I'm not you. And that's just, that's not my brain. And I guess that, that today is really a, a reply to her because it's not my brain either. And, uh, you know, my couple of fans I see on here already, um, it's not your brains, not initially. And that's what we're talking about, really. That, that's, that's the thing that keeps coming back again and again and again and again. You see these books on the shelf behind me? They're not saying that you're born and your mind is perfect. They're not saying that you can wake up one day and be a guru. They're not saying that uh, you, you get out of grade school and you're a sage. That's BS. What, it's, what, what that is saying, and what everything, all of these books, you want to talk about Chinese masters over here? You want to talk about Greek masters over here? You want to talk about um, 
<laughs> 60s, 70s hippie masters down there. What a lot of them seem to agree on is that there are two different births that we experience in this life. Two different births. The first birth is when we emerge from the womb and then spend the next several years learning how to be a person, fit in society, train our bodies really into how to behave in a culture in a way that makes sense for our culture. And in a lot of ways, we're really successful at that because we keep growing. The population, the world, we, we keep progressing. So we're doing something right, right? But also we understand now, we understand that a lot of the way that people have been trained and grown up and, and continue forward is based in perceptions of trauma. I would love to say it's actual trauma. There are plenty of people that deal with actual trauma and it really highly affects them. It changes them. It, it, it damages them in so many ways. But even just experiencing life, even just it, living as a child, even just playing as a child, even just figuring out, you know, am I loved? Uh, is, my, is my family taking care of me? Like these questions pop up in the head of a kid a lot. And if they don't see the evidence that they look for, that you look for when you're that age, if they don't see that specific evidence, then the love's not there. They're not enough. They can't do things if they receive a criticism or a couple of criticisms, stack them up over time, and it's really aggressive on the self. And I say this self and I touch my chest. And I, because when I say this self, I really mean the self, the body, the particle, the physical, the, the, all of this. Because in a lot of ways, that communication is training the mind-body connection, how to react in the future in those circumstances. That's that cellular memory, that fight-or-flight memory, the caveman kind of thing. Only it talks to the body and creates this subconscious sense within us that lands in our tissues. I posted a post earlier today that was all about the different types of emotional things that happen in the tissue of the body. Some of that's Chinese medicine. Some of that's just chakras, which is a, a Indian Hindu a yogic kind of practice. And it's the body that is holding all of this schmutz. <laughs> I wanted to use a worse word. I just went with schmutz. That's a good one. Um, and so the thing is, you know, that's the first birth. And there's growing pains through that first birth. Because you got to figure out how to be a person. You got to figure out how to fit in. You got to figure out how this physical body is actually going to keep surviving. And if this were, uh, if this were a hundred years ago, it would be much more difficult for you. If this were 500 years ago, it would be even more difficult. If this were a thousand years ago or 2000 years ago, it would be more difficult, but you would adapt if you were born. Experience now. Everything that we have in our society is built on, well, I won't say everything, but a lot of what we have in society right now is built on Newtonian physics, on materialism, on consciousness being, oh, just a function of the way the brain is. And so people say, well, I don't have your brain. I can't, I can't think like that. I can't do that. This is where the second birth comes in. Because the second birth is, is sort of the birth of choice. It's, it's the birth of looking backwards. Who's to say we don't look backwards when we're in the womb, right? <laughs> look where we came from. All of everything and nothing. This woo kind of cloud of quantum wave. Woo. That was then. Now I'm going into a physical body to dive in. You know, that sort of thing. 
Maybe it happens. I don't know. But the second birth is an interesting one because the Buddha experienced it. It seems like Alan Watts certainly had something, a piece of it. Uh, Ram Das certainly. Uh, Eckhart Tolle, yes, absolutely. <sighs> Joe Dispenza, Bruce Lipton, Elaine Duncan... Abraham Hicks. And they all seem to come up... Oh, Napoleon Hill. There's a good one. Um, they all seem to come to the point of, look, there's a point where when you're trying to move forward and you're not, then you got to come to some conclusion that something needs to change. You probably need to change. And the idea of a second birth is that you get to start choosing what actually makes you happy about your life. You get to start choosing the directions that you move with more intention. You get to start choosing what you feed your brain, the words and the pictures that are actually helping you move forward, helping you get over troublesome past, helping you feel and heal some of this stuff inside. That's the change that's about growth and transformation. That's the change that is about moving into the fear and the anger and understanding in some sense why it's there. And it's debatable. You can do this with a shrink. You can do this with a counselor. You can do this with friends. You, you can sit there and talk your head off and pay for talk doctors uh, for years and years and years. And you're working with the conscious mind. So, you know, that's awesome. Um, in, in my opinion, the conscious mind is troublesome because that really has that pendulum energy. So you, you imagine something, you think something, but deeper down in the body and the energy and the, in the, in the waves and in, in this, you're not really getting there. I mean, I, I think that's why so many talk docs can, you know, book out a year in advance, two years in advance, three years in advance, because they don't expect people to actually get better. It's about expressing yourself and feeling heard. And if in your life you never expressed yourself and felt heard, that's fantastic. But if you're actually trying to move through some of these things, you kind of got to go a little bit deeper. And that's where Eastern philosophy, that's where um, yogic practice, that's where, you know, Hindu ideas, concepts, chakras, energy work, uh, meditation. This is where this stuff comes in because this actually gets the brain and the body on a, <laughs> pardon the pun, similar wavelength. Right? You, the, the, the conscious mind believes in this pendulum sort of duality contrasting thing because you, can't, you cannot move forward in the logical conscious brain until you recognize the past and then, oop, then you can move forward. You have to have something to push against. So a lot of times we critique ourselves, call ourselves names, put ourselves down. And the reason is that somewhere in our head, we think that by doing that, we identify our weaknesses. We identify our, our points of badness. And then we can choose something better. We can choose a path. We can walk a path that's good. You know, if I have to sit here and complain about everything that went wrong today, that way I am, you know, possibly making my way and preparing for a better day tomorrow. But the brain doesn't work that way. When you tell yourself bad things about yourself today, the brain hears that you are bad. It doesn't recognize time doesn't recognize tomorrow, doesn't recognize yesterday, just now. So as you go over those ideas, you are training your mind to fill your brain with crap. And that's not good for you. It's not good for anybody. So you have all of the capability, capability to think like me, to think like Napoleon Hill, to think like Dale Carnegie, to think like Ram Dass, to think like uh, Joe Dispenza, to think like anybody. Buddha? You want to be Buddha? Put your mind to the sake and think like the Buddha. Read books about the Buddha. Read books about quotes from the Buddha. Start putting that information into your head. Because when you absorb it, when you watch a movie, a TV show, read a book, when you listen to music over and over again, the words get in your head. 
You're programming yourself, and it doesn't take long. I'm sure you've listened to a song over and over and over and over and over again until you knew the words without even thinking about it. it takes, what, a week? Maybe? If it's a good song, it takes three days. The reason I know that you can do this, absolutely, is because neuroscience has shown the truth of neuroplasticity. Neurons in the head change their connections. They are not static. And if you think that you can't change, that you can't encompass a brighter, healthier, more positive self, then that's a belief that you gained somewhere. And it's kind of up to you to say, well, why did I have that belief? What good is it doing me if it keeps bringing me down? What good is it doing me if it doesn't allow the neurogenesis, the new connections of neurons in my brain, the neuroplasticity really at work, changing connections, firing and wiring in more positive connections? Because the more positive connection you have, the greater, like, happy proteins, boosting metabolism proteins, um neurotransmitters that get you to feel positive and energy within the body showing that because the brain controls the body. And when you tell the brain, I am great, I am awesome, I am taking care of everything today, the world loves me, the universe has things work out just in my favor. You're programming so much more than your mind. You are programming your body to listen to you, to follow you on that path that you want to take. You're actually taking control of your life. I wish everybody took a little bit more control of their life, right? Don't we all? Because so much time we end up fighting with people who are centered on themselves, that are centered on their needs, that are centered on uh, their view of the universe, and they will argue someone else down. Because they're stuck. And that's okay. Because it takes all kinds. Everybody is at a different point of this journey. And I say that there are two births. The first one happens really early in your life, right? And then you go through a whole bunch of shit because that's just life. That's growing up. That's what that is. That's training. And when you move past that, then you gain the capability at some point to start figuring out yourself for yourself and the people around you. That's the second birth. Pretty sure that was Alan Watts that cited the two births. And the thing is that some people go through incredible hardships. Life really throws the junk at them. And they take that opportunity to improve themselves, to improve their view of the world, to improve how they interface with the world, to improve how they interface with themselves, how they understand themselves. They redefine themselves in terms of everything. That's kind of getting woke, right? <laughs> if I understand woke right. Um, and that's been happening for eons. Lao Tzu, um, Confucius, uh, these guys all had epiphanies about the way that life, the universe, was structured. Uh, Hermes Trimestus um, is the guy that came up with the idea of, you know, energy and the law of attraction thousands of years ago. We're not actually coming up with anything new anymore. I hate to tell you. It's not new. It's just that with science, we're seeing how the old stuff is actually true and that we have to kind of stop reaching outside of ourselves to find the happiness. Because it's here, and it's here, and it's here. I know, I get a little passionate about this stuff. Um, here's the thing. A lot of the time we are disconnected from our bodies. We've been, become so entrained by our society to be, without even knowing it, very particle, materially focused. The brain thinks things. The brain does things. I don't control my brain because the brain is just the thing that does the thinking. But it's not. 
and more and more science shows the brain is just the computer chip. It's just the processor. It's the part that comes and brings things together all at once. Your L1 cache, your L2 cache, L3 cache, and all of a sudden you got L4, 5, 6 cache kind of just flooding in information into this processor that has different areas that, that register and th push through different bits of information until you get to the point that you make a decision and act on it. And it's pulling together so much information from outside your body and inside your body. But so much of the time we think that it is just, like the brain is just driving us and that we don't have control over it. And today I'm telling you, you do. You have complete control over it. You're not trained to use it. And that sucks right now. Or maybe you're in the process of training your brain which I'd love because <laughs> that means you're telling yourself how amazing you are, how wonderful you are, how handsome, strong, beautiful, courageous you are. And you deserve that because here's, here's the thing. Everything we do in life clouds, who we came into this world as. If a baby's brain is essentially absent of all these filters of society and things like racism don't exist to a baby. When a baby's hungry, it believes it's going to be fed. So it cries. It doesn't matter what time of day or night it is. When a baby wants love and attention, it cries because it knows or believes that somewhere around it are people that will give it attention. That baby 100% believes it is worthy. It is beautiful. It deserves food and attention and focus. What that means is that there is a central core, a central energy, a central being that when it comes down into that body, into that baby, believes. 100% it is worthy of being alive. It is enough to simply be there, sit there, cry, whine, smile, laugh, do those little gurgly noises. And that's fine. And as it grows, it changes, right? Some of that personality stays. Some of that personality as that kid gets older stays. And if it's lucky, if we are lucky, because we would get to experience that life. If we are lucky, some of that remains in us, underneath the filters, underneath the filters of growing up in society and community and work and school and responsibility. That essence is still there. Ram Dass uh, cites the Hindu culture and thoughts, beliefs, and says that's Atman. The energy beyond us, above us, like around us, that is pure us with none of the faults, none of the flaws. That's Atman. It's the perfect sense of you as one piece of the eternal quantum field. If you watch the show Magicians, um, and one of the last seasons, the... Uh, uh, they, they, they show people who are in the afterlife and they get rid of a lot of the pain because there's no need for it. Right. And it's sort of that it, it's, I, I love that because that's the concept is look, that pain is body focused, that hurt, that division, that confusion is body focused. And it's up to us to try to move past that, to learn who we actually are underneath all of this so that we can effectively live the best life that we can. Because if we're worthy, if we are enough, which we are, absolutely, then the point of life is not to keep working for somebody else. The point of life is to express ourselves and to experience everything that we can. Because the destination ultimately is death. And you can look at that as a, as a negative. I think it's a positive because death is a transition. Just as birth was a transition. There was nothing, then there was you. And then there will be nothing again. And while you're here, 
before the in-between time, before the respawning, before the, you know, the reincarnation or none at all, stepping off the cycle of reincarnation, stepping off of anything. Before any of that happens, you have to enjoy this. You have to figure out how to enjoy this experience because the more miserable you are, the more miserable this experience becomes. That's what the mind tells us. That's what neuroscience tells us. And when we enjoy right now, when we appreciate and show gratitude for all the things that we actually are, are liking about our life, our friends, the, our family that we choose to have, our loves, our pets. <laughs> when we show gratitude for these things, it really does improve our quality of life. And you're capable of having all of this light bulb moment for yourself. Because your brain is no different from mine, is no different from anybody in history. The founding fathers of the United States weren't geniuses, they were normal people like you and me. They had some good ideas. Good ideas are powerful things. Good ideas transform the world. Good ideas transform you. The world needs more good ideas lately. And the world needs more people willing to say, I have a good idea, and I'm willing to be responsible for my good idea. Responsible just meaning I am able to respond. If someone asks about something, I am able to respond. If someone comments, I am able to respond. If someone wants in on it, I'm able to respond. That's it. It's not a bad thing. It's not a curse word. It's not something to shy away from being responsible. It means you're able to do something about it. If, whether that's put somebody off or take their name or take their number or actually help them, whatever that is. And right now, there's so many people kind of just kicking back on, I can't. It's, it's too far. It's too hard. It's too, it's too much. I need, someone, I need someone else to do you know, the hard work for me and I'll, I'll follow along. Okay, that's your trip, that's your journey. I understand, but here's the thing. You are all capable of this journey. If you want it, if you're ready for it, if you want to take the steps, they're right there before you. So uh, all that to say that uh, my sales pitch is supposed to be what's next, which is uh, my manifest design, my advertising, branding, uh, marketing, process that is all about you and your vision and brand and all that kind of stuff. You know what? Blah, blah, blah. If you're interested, go check it out. Thinktankcreative.net um, and read about manifest design. I love this process. I think it's a fantastic process. Um, I love working with the people who are um, coming with their own vision of what they want to build and really trying to figure out how to translate and find the right words to share what they want to build with the world. Because it's not just the world, it's yourself just like all of this. This is this is figuring out your next steps for your life. What words can you use that are excuse me, that are healthy, that are positive, that are effective to get you moving, to get you excited about life, to get you not just whatever's in the past. Right? We did this we did this yesterday. We know that we can complain and look at the past and look at everything that's negative, and that's one option for the future. But we also know that we can examine the exact opposite of that. And too often we skip that step. We don't look at the future. We just complain, 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 complain. And that is not training the brain right. That is not training the mind right. And in every active experience, there is the conscious and the other than conscious mind. Both of those together are the mind. That's not to say that's the brain. That's just the mind. The mind is a concept. The mind, like time, like gravity. All the stuff that we debate, whether it's actually real or not, or it's just something we've put a name to, the mind is just that. And it's something you can train. Like lifting weights. You can't lift 100 pounds, start smaller, then build up to it. You can get there. I absolutely believe in you. I love you. And I hope you have an amazing weekend. Take care.